Hello there, everybody. Little Al Stewart in the background. You're the cat. How are y'all? Good to see you. Uh, it's Thor's day, so I hope you are ready. So, uh, favor to us all, and we are all prospering. We're going to get into that. Welcome, everybody, all the moderators, you beautiful soul beings. Everybody else, you're soul beings as well, and you're beautiful. So, uh, so good to see you, and again, happy Thor's Day. So, we'll get that going, and then we got that going, and it's all going <laughs> so i think we're all there i don't know are you there i'm there and uh off we go so so good to be here and um looks like everything is normal groovy i like it when everything is normal but then what is normal best quote normal is what everybody else is and you're not there you go so, uh, hey, Nina, what's up? Dave Sullivan, good to see you. Hey, Kaz Hawks, much love to you. Got to get you on, dear. And good to see you. David Castle, I hope you're feeling good. Susie Q, hello, Gaia and Paul. Saturday is going to be a good date. Uh, so I'll be sending that. Uh, hello, Martin and Heidi, good to see you. And hello, Tony. Jules, good to see you. Marissa, beloved Abstract, Emperor X. Man, the house is fooling up. Filling up, filling up, filling up. Yeah, all right past, present. We're both the future. We're the past. We're the present. There you go. Figure that one out. Uh, let's see. Big Al, good to see you. Thank you, sir. Nice shirt. <laughs> well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you ought to see it with the tie. There you go. Uh, let's see. Brent, the gent. How are you, my friend? Brandy, good to see you. And Tony, um, let's see. Athena, hello, Scotty boy, Elderberry. Lots of people in the room. So favor everyone. We speak prosperity over us all. Actually, we're all prospering, but we're going to get into that. Mm. Love the tea, man. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So uh, tonight on artistsfirst.com, 8 p.m. my time, mountain time, 10 p.m. Well, uh, East Coast, um, Steiger perspective. Check it out. Is the Biden administration a satanic organization? So check it out. You're going to love it. Uh, hello there, a dope dwarf. <laughs> we, we love everyone. Mark, good to see you. So uh, Gaza, how are you, my friend? I am so pleased to see you. It's early in the morning for you folks. Um, wow. I... I, I tell you what's going on down there, folks. That ain't right. Uh, just ain't right. Kathy, how are you doing? Go, go. Much love to you, beloved. And uh, Loretta, Julie, good to see you. That just sucks. I got to tell you, Gaza, it just sucks. And, you know, Liberty Beach. I mean, it's, I, I, I'm concerned that what's happening there will begin to spread out through the world. And we don't need that, folks. We don't need it. That's all I got to say. So, uh, check it out tonight. You'll, you'll, it won't be a waste of your time. So I was thinking this morning in my meditation, and I came up with basically kind of three questions I'm asking myself from this study we're doing and from previous studies, because it, it all correlates. Why the interest in humanity? Why? Doesn't make sense. If these beings existed before we did, then what was the agenda? Hey, Isby, what's up? Good to see you. Um, all right. So answer that one. So since they are involved, is it something that we did? Is it something they did? What caused the interaction? And then you have to say, all right, so we've been presented with these this group on this side, this group on this side. I'm the good guy. No, I'm the good guy. No, I'm the bad guy. No, that's the bad guy. You know what I'm saying? So the question occurred to me, who stands to benefit the most by the following? A, if man were on a path of some sort of ascension, 
the history would say that isn't true, but I mean, it just doesn't. I mean, if, if we're on the path of ascension, we seem to be in the repeating washing machine, you know, the figure eight, as Trina says, and Trina, the way I look at it, dear, I've been thinking if there's a, if there was a way we got in, there has to be a way to get out. All right. So a, if we are on this road of ascension, is there anything outside and take religion out of the equation? We can't, you know, forget about religion. It's just a mind trip. Um, we want to know what really is going on here. So what's the purpose? So if man's on the road to ascension, who stands to benefit if man reaches that goal? Who stands to lose the most? If man is never on that path, then who's benefiting from the path that we're on currently? Just some things we're going to think about today. <laughs> uh, hey, Lois, good to see you, dear. How did you make through the storms, hon? Uh, I hope you're doing well. Shannon, good to see you as well. So good to see so many of you. Deborah Sloan, hello. Good to see you. Um, so the angel today, very cool one. This is Nanel. Nanel has got like one of the most elaborate um, sigils. I mean, check that out. And this angel is the angel of mysticism and spiritual communication. Deus suborum depressor. God humiliating the proud patron of abstract science and philosophy. <laughs> Gee, I love it. I mean, I just randomly picked it out of the bag. Protector of spiritual workers and teachers. Brings knowledge and inspiration and harmony. Teaches how to meditate and practice spiritual works. Helps to pass on our ideas easily and to become a better speaker, allows us to connect with a higher part of ourselves and gives us access to the higher realms. I love this. Nanel, we dig you. Um, facilitates interprospection and communication with the divine, the spiritual world, and other dimensions. Oh, baby. Come on in. Let's have a, some coffee or some tea. A uh, uh, symbol of solitude bestows us with enlightenment, fills us with energy to contemplate higher plans of existence. Hmm. Since we never actually die, should not at some point we begin to plan for the next? journey? I often wonder, did we plan for this journey? Or is this this simply chaos and randomness? Um, let's see, supports us if we are scared to face life head on and shows how to strengthen your weaknesses and reveal your strengths. Frees us from the fear of failure. Ooh, that's powerful provides with a great knowledge of the esoteric world. I dig this angel. Encourages the study of science. Protects from false spiritual teachers without proper knowledge. Cures spiritual ignorance and lack of respect for others. Wow. Best time to reach this angel is 520 to 539 p.m. Well, now that's pretty cool. Best day to reach this angel is on October 10th. And uh, it is under the Archangel Haniel. It is the Ten of Wands. Wow, there we go. Cool angel. <laughs> Johnny Angel. So today <clears throat> we start our next 11 days. And 
it was brought to my attention in thinking about this that um, angels like to work in pairs. They like to work with other angels, other angels that are in more in line to the same energies. And so um, got the angel Poel. Now, Poel is an interesting angel. Um, I will show you. It's, um, give me one second, because I want to make sure I got this right. There we go. So this is Poel's sigil. Now, this is a great angel to have on this next 11 days. You may want to keep the angel um, in your lineup. It's on my wall. Poyel is an angel of the order of principality. He rules over fortune and philosophy. He is also one of the 72 angels of the Zodiac. His corresponding angel is uh, Themiso. Um, Let's see. Poyel is one of the 72 angels bearing the mystical name of God, Shemhaporaya. His sigil is reproduced in the emblem. So, um, yeah, pretty cool angel. And just a little background on the Deus Philinius Omne, God sustaining everything. Wait till you hear this angel. This angel is the patron of renown and celebrity, protector of positive thinkers. Oh, are they talking to us or what? Brings fortune and wealth on every level of our life. Helps to express yourselves clearly and simply allows us to find new ideas connected with self-development, turns materialistic lifestyle into a spiritual one. Now, that's some transmutation. Wow. Uh, turns, uh, let's see, symbol of luck, hope, power, and knowledge. you got to love this angel. Um, bestows us with modesty empathy, simplicity, and humility. Fills us with energy to create a good atmosphere. Are you just loving this angel? Poyel, poyel, poyel. There we go. Um, teaches us how to be altruistic. I love this. Shows how to fix financial problems. Teaches us how to change our behavior if we are materialistically, ideologically, or by lifestyle. Provides with optimism and a good sense of humor. I mean, this kind of answers some questions, you know, does your personality transcend to the next realm? I think so, yes. All these angels have got personalities. It's, it's interesting. Um, protects from the absence of happiness, brings a smile on our face, liberates from destitution and all problems relating to the lack of income or prosperity. Folks, I just chose this. It, it was in my thought in the shower, and I didn't even remember who, you know, Poyel was. I said, okay, let's just see, because Ariel seemed to be talking, and now I, I get it. I get the, the, the connection with these two. Um, teaches how to reduce criticism, helps to find the positive in others in certain situations. Cures the lack of modesty, vanity, and excessive complaining. Heals controversy, excesses, and exaggerations. Great source of healing energy. Helps in situations like ab ab abundance issues, lack of resources, worldly pleasures, inhibitions, and mediocrity. Oh, folks, can I get a soul tribe vote? Is this not like 
the and when <coughs> oh perfect best time to reach this angel is 6:20 to 6:39 p.m. Hmm. So again, it's of the uh, angels of the principalities. Again, the archangel here is Hanel again. All right. So um, I say we keep these two, Ariel and Poyel, into the lineup. So as we know, Part two of this experiment is to see if we can duplicate the last. And by the way, I've gotten several more emails of feathers. I've gotten several more emails of prosperity, people getting money from employers. Um, yeah. So at least once a day for the next 11 days, Think and say out loud, the soul tribe is prospering. I am prospering. We all are prospering together. And just simply give a thank you. What is wrong by saying thank you? I mean, have we become so callous that we can't have some kind of decorum here? You know, little etiquette. So we are thanking Ariel and Poyel um, for bringing and allowing us to, number one, be in a state of prosperity, but be in a constant state, a constant condition of prospering. So we're going to do it. Those of you who have been wanting, I think the, the count we had last time, and I'm just estimating here, but I know the hard count I had, we had reached over 150 people participating in this. Now, I'd love to double that and see what happens. And we'll be giving uh, thanks to Poyel uh, and uh, Ariel. I mean, both of these, you know, Ariel is the angel of revelations. Poyel is the angel of fortune and support. I think those two go hand in hand. I don't know about you. I can dig it. So anyway, uh, this is, I think this is kind of, it is important. It's important that, um, Yes, save, as he comes back into frame. Um, let's do it. It's working in our lives. Lynn and I were talking last night, and folks, it's coming from all different directions, unexpected places, and that's what Ariel actually does. Um, again, I read to you in Davidson's book, uh, in this one, I mean, this has become like the full-time Al. I know you, I've got to get you on Al, Cause I want to talk about how, what it's happening to you and Perry on this one, uh, with you doing all the work on the 72 angels and that deck we'll be giving away, uh, Dave. Um, I think it's Sullivan. I don't want to get that wrong, but I think it is. Uh, we'll be giving away three of the decks of cards here and probably going to get Al and Trina and love to have Dave on, to be honest with you. So uh, in the 72 uh, Angels of Magic and uh, Increase, obtains any of desire. This is what Poyel does. Uh, this power sounds a little too good to be true but it is one of the members of the gallery of magic have all used with good results. Make sure you call on this angel when the desire seems vital to your very existence, rather than merely because the desire is pleasing to you. Yeah. Um, it says a second approach is to use this magic when you have a desire that has almost come to fruition several times, but has never quite made it through to reality. This angel will break through the barrier. Oh, Poyel, yeah, we're calling on you. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, this angel can help you to help to bring in personal char charisma, also develops uh, your fame and your luck. 
get the best results, ask for an increase in fame and fortune in that particular area of your life that matters greatly to you. Ideally, this should be your main profession or hobby that you want to turn into a profession. In short, use the power on things that really matter to you and that have a potential to bring fame and fortune. Love this angel. Uh, it says uh, to bring fame through talent. When you're working with your natural talent, this angel can help to make you famous through the application of your talent. Call on the angel to make your talent to become recognized by those who can help you. Ask the angel to bring you fame where it matters most and to make your fans love you for the genuine talent that you are offering. Yeah. What can you say? <laughs> uh, beautiful, beautiful sigil. Um, and I know, Al, you've done it. So anyway, um, as... So there we go. Interesting, the origin of these beans. I mean, what is their purpose? I mean, is it really just that, to help the individual through this life? Because this is actually planet hell. You don't need to invent one. This one is. But it's amazing how these beans can help those who can make it absolutely Elysium. I don't know. What's y'all's opinion on that? Hello, Ron. Howdy from Washington State. Well, how are you, sir? Rod How? good to see you. Uh, hello, Tony. Wild Wolf, what's up? Just a question. Thumbs up, folks. That's all I got to say. Something is up. Something going on, too. I mean, the reports, the feathers is what's really just, it tickles, you know. It, 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 it makes me happy because in the sense that, you know, they weren't there before. My yard is still filled with feathers. They still haven't gone away. I don't know. What's up with that? Having a clue, having a clue. All right. Uh, bum, 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 bum. I'd love to see some of the comments. <laughs> Marguerite says, I just said on forbidden knowledge. Yeah. Krista sent me an email this morning. It's helpful and confusing at the same time to see where we were then and are now, isn't that the truth? Just had the strangest deja vu sensation when I was reading that. It's interesting. Yeah. Okay, let's get into this day that the continued study of demons. We're about to get into the origin. I mean, I've been thinking about this. You know, I guess if 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 they exist in the construct of duality then it's a matter of perspective by the seven principles of the Kabbalion through hermetics that we know all things can be reconciled. And when you look at things, everything on a polarity, it's on the same line. If you have an angel that's doing these wonderful things, when you ask them to, apparently you have to ask before they react, then what are you saying that the, the bad guys are doing again? And exactly what is their purpose? It's funny, Lynn and I, and I asked her that question, and she just looked at me, and she kind of got her head down, looked at her glasses, and she said, well, you, you, she says, you, you, you ask a very good question now. If religion is out of it, you take politics out of it, and then what, what's the purpose? What? Now, King says that well, what their real purpose is, is that they restrict our ability to enact our free will. Let's continue to find out on this as we get back into our reading with the origins of these particular creatures, the origins of demons. This book is a study of demons and is itself a work of demonology. It is not a study of demonology or a study of ideas about demons handed down 
through the ages. The subject of this study is the demon themselves. Unfortunately for the casual reader, it is not possible to understand the demons without some background in the subject of theology and culture, of history and literature, or of widespread and ancient folk beliefs. I would say that this channel, yeah, I, I would say that we've graduated. Um, we're, we're definitely at the uh, doctorate level now. And that can take forever, who knows. Uh, such things will be presented here, but as it covers a large amount of information and does not all relate directly to demonic spirits, there will be a limited selection. This is, after all, a book intended for the general public and should not be construed as scholarly. The word demon itself is often discussed in studies of demonology. There is some academic debate over the precise significance of this word and its relation to demons in the popular sense. I have made every effort to remain consistent with the popular and I believe correct usage of the word demons as referring particularly to evil spirits. The standard line of reference on the word demon indicates that it was at one time a somewhat generic term for spirits, all spirits. Not all spirits exactly, nor as an equivalent to the personal solar spirit, but as an intelligent immortal being. All right, so they're intelligent, they're immortal, and they have self-awareness. Well, they ain't like us, so that makes them different than us. The term is used to refer to a source of inspiration or otherwise to indicate a spiritual influence whose origin is neither human nor divine. Okay. It should come as no surprise that there is so little clarity in the early definition of the word, since what we can deduce is drawn from several hundred years worth of writings. In that time, a word can be taken to mean different things for different people, and it is impossible to place an idea like demon in its proper context. It is clear, however, that the demon is always represented as a spiritual entity with an independent will. That's a species, at least in my thinking. My vernacular is going, Steiger, you know, these are ETs. They're aliens. Unless we can find evidence that says that they're only known to this realm, Earth. I mean, are there demons on Jupiter? Are there demons on the Andromeda galaxy? I mean, how far does this go? It often begs the question, when we die, are we truly stuck here? Maybe in a different plane, a different time dimension, but it's still here, still a planet revolving around a medium yellow dwarf star. I don't know. At times, the demons are described as having a relation with a person as though it were an extension of the identity, a genius or motivation behind the facade. In rock and roll, many of you who may have been connected to the, the industry, it's well known that many of the, uh, the uh, greats, something happens when you have 10, 15, 20 plus thousand people sending so much energy at you. You see, the spirits become very jealous, very envious of that. And so they become a part of it because that's powerful, baby. Works both ways, whether you're in a religious or out there just having a good time. 
Um, this position is often adapted when attempting to rationalize demonology into a more acceptable scheme of personal psychology. At other times, the word is given as a general title of spirits, which is a position often used to portray demons as neutral or benevolent entities. Well, that's just completely ass backwards from what, you know, the general perception is. More often than not, the attempt to redefine the word demon is conjoined to an effort at making the subject appear more welcoming to the audience. The reader is presumed to have a respect for sciences like psychology, and so the idea of a personal genius as equivalent to demons makes them a more palatable subject. To a person who wishes to escape ignorance, the suggestion that a more informed person would look to word origins and find something less monstrous is an appealing invitation. Whatever the word demon once meant, at the present time, in almost all parts of the world, it, or its very close equivalent, signifies malicious spiritual entities of sinister, sinister purpose and usually considerable power. Rather than understand the origins of the word demon, it is more important to understand the origins of demons themselves. Before any further inquiry into the origins of demons, it is important to understand what is meant by the question. It is not possible to know with any certainty from where demons came or what made them demonic or any other such fantasy of the primeval creation. There are great stacks of books, many quite ancient, that detail the creation of such spirits, their fall from grace, their wars with gods and men. The better of these will be mentioned later in the chapter for sake of further study, but such issues are not of any real importance to demonology. Instead of pondering the numbers of the fallen angels, it is far more important to understand the ways in which demons appear in the lives of individuals, their cultures, and the world in general. From whatever or however they arrived originally in existence, evil spirits have influenced the state of human affairs and have brought about at least some change in human destiny. The important question of origins for the demonologist is not the point at which demons became demons, but the point at which people became, began taking their advice. Many subjects have been handed over to the demons where such a connection might not actually exist. There are many thousands of people, perhaps millions, who engage daily in what their peers consider sinful. It is irrational to assume that a significant percentage of these individuals have any direct contact with demonic spirits, whether such spirits are known or not. Sinful behavior, the precise definition of which differs between cultures, is universal to human society. One society may view a thing as despicable, where another might find the same act noble or of neutral value. The impulse to commit actions in defiance of social norms to violate the value code of a peer group is found in every society of every size. Over a considerable amount of time, all cultures will come to view the least approved actions of its participants as the ones inspired by demons. The demons have not arisen from such pastimes, but in many cases have engaged therein for their benefit. It should be apparent to everyone that the world is a place full of trouble and pain, despite all efforts to the contrary. And regardless of any amount of goodness that exists, in every corner of the world, from the most primitive societies to the top of the industrialized nations, there is some form of corruption, disharmony, and malice to be found. These evil forces may not in fact rule the world, but they are obviously a part of it. And in all places, they are unwelcome. It is my sincere doubt that even the most avid criminal 
would choose to cause suffering to the innocent if given an acceptable alternative. Along with similar line of thought, it is commonly said that government is well-intended, but it is the lesser of evils designed to stave, starve off greater ones. There is some truth to this evident in any government that reserves the right to legislate. In that, such powers stem from the knowledge that no present legal code is perfect and therefore may be modified to generate a better society. Nonetheless, the law and government in support of the law cannot produce a perfect society. It has failed miserably throughout history, often committing grievous atrocities against human rights when attempting to do so. The fact that government overshadows the daily actions of the people leads many to place blame on the shoulders of politicians for whatever is wrong in their lives. It is a simple thing to make note of changes in policy and the motives of those making the policy, and then to claim corruption has overtaken the nation. It is beyond doubt that there is an uncertain level of corruption in government. The larger bureaucratic systems are no more or less filled with the brim with every manner of calmly as any tyrannical despotic regime. Small wonder, then, that government takes the blame for the troubles of the world. It holds much of the power, is credited with much responsibility, and is well known in all nations to be the subject of unethical actions. So, hmm, do demons deal with just individuals or would they rather deal with governments? They seem to be hell-bent on power, but they seem to have a lot of power. So who's giving what? The idea that the government is entirely responsible for trouble and pain is plainly untenable. Even the most vicious critics of present policy will cite people and events beyond the government as the real source of the difficulty in many situations. Blame cannot be simply laid at the foot of the lawmakers, and yet there remains an undeniable presence of evil beyond government. There are various layers of secret persons with sinister motives who supposedly bear the burden of creating evil in the world. The most credible arguments point fingers towards business owners who stand to profit from the impositions of laws that benefit their businesses. As with the accusations laid against the lawmakers themselves, there is some merit to the argument. One example here is the military. In most civilized nations, the military absorbs a staggering amount of tax money in comparison to other less violent institutions. The businesses providing the military with hardware stand to gain tremendously as the government allots more money towards their purchases. A consequence is an increase in the need or desire to use the weaponry thus obtained and a general increase in the gravity of national belligerence. Likely, it is not the intention of those who, who manufactured the missiles warplanes, machine guns, nerve gas, to create a more violent world, but they have certainly made violence a more devastating thing than it has ever been in the past. Another private interest that has used the governments of the world to enforce destructive policy is the pharmaceutical industry. For advanced civilizations, pharmaceutical drugs have taken over the thoughts of large segments of the population. The unwinning victims who in one way or another, are paying to be drugged who willingly believe such mind-bending chemicals are good for them, are led to stagger through life in a daze. Drugs intended to relieve anxiety to allow tolerance of work-related demands have instead robbed many people of their ability to make clear plans, communicate properly, or accumulate any substantial knowledge. That's robbing your soul, baby. Many of these drugs also have serious and delirious, um, yeah, get that right, delirious side effects. Yet due to their profitability, such information is purposely kept from the public view. 
Additionally, there are millions of criminals, scam artists, and other interests that operate outside the pales of government, yet who make use of government to their personal advantage and at public expense. Many of these interests simply do not cooperate with each other or are totally opposed to each other. It would be irrational to conclude that such persons or organizations are to be held responsible for any sort of unified effort to pr produce harm. Yet such is their overall effect that there is hardly a place in the inhabited world where one can be completely free of their wicked work. The idea of a unified force of evil has always held some popularity and should be addressed in its proper turn. Since the governments of the world share similar modes of oppression and inconvenience, and since government so often appears incompetent and staffed by fools, it has long been fashionable to propose some greater and well-organized body behind the politicians pulling the strings, as it were. Due to the strife between different private interests and the lack of dominance in, in, in any industry as over in one or the other, the idea that a single private interest rules all the others has been long ruled out. At times, certain problems have been blamed on the banking industry or upon the clergy, but even these have been eventually dismissed as inadequate. In order to devise a model for an organization powerful enough to control governments and private interests alike, the most popular approach has always been to create imaginary secret societies. The premise of a secret society is very simple. A small and powerful group controls everything from the outcome of wars to the content of breakfast cereal through clandestine and sometimes criminal interventions for obscure purposes arranged around ambiguous ideals. This is, of course, a broad generalization of the topic, but is sufficient for the scope of the present work. As an idea, it has gained popularity wherever the course of society seemed unreasonably yet effective, giving a feeling of security to those who take comfort in the existence of someone in charge. The most eager proponents of secret society lore are usually voicing an opposition to it. The basic message is that someone is in control, even if we are unaware of who they are. How can they, uh, how they are controlling anything or what they are trying to accomplish? It is much easier and more comfortable for these people to live in a world where there is some fundamental authority rather to, to, than to live in a world of chaos confusion, and competition. We're getting into something here because he's stripping away all the excuses here. And it's true, isn't it? Don't most people feel subconsciously that, well, there's somebody in charge here? There has to be. There must be. Because if there's no one in charge, in reality, no God, no heaven, no hell, but something entirely different. We're in deep, deep trouble. No one's in charge. Never has been. Well, that's a uh, radical idea. Unfortunately, the idea of human conspirators in secret meetings designed to guide the destiny of the world falls flat in a number of places. Such societies are not established among insane, hyperactive, tyrannical fanatics, and only such a person could possibly manage such a vast operation. In the real world, in contrast to the imaginary world of the conspiracy theorists, people are individuals with personal taste, independent plans, and usually a respect for others. I happen to know a few of the people who are often accused of running the world as part of the global Illuminati, and I assure you that is not what they do. They drive nice cars, eat fancy foods sometimes, but they get their jollies by having their wall paneling redecorated by dedicated wood finishers, not by manipulating the global economy so that the poor become enslaved. Confronted by the fact that people cannot, and as a rule, do not control the world with sinister puppet strings, 
one determined to make a case for the intrusion of organized and universal oversight must resort to hypothetical entities. More than anything else, extraterrestrial aliens have been identified as the secret power behind all the unfathomable works of hidden tyranny. Fans of this idea propose that the aliens are either intent on inhibiting the progress of mankind or that they are making an effort to aid us gradually within their inscrutable framework. Like the secret society theory, this appeals on the basis of an assumed controlling body. I think we're hitting on something. And since we can ascribe any amount of fanaticism to an alien, it does not fall into the same pits as the one trying to read ulterior motives into benign conversations with the rich and powerful. I'm not opposed to the idea of the existence of alien life. And instead, I take for granted that the universe is teething with life in every available corner. I do not regard intelligence or even communicable intelligence as a rarity among uncountable stars or in the deep sea or within the earth. I do not dispute the possibility that such life can, has, or will contact mankind in any way. That being said, I must also admit that I'm opposed to the alien controller idea, all of its variations, and on account of motive. The attainment of the powerful elite and their supposed goals as well as those ascribed to any alien life form are insufficient to justify the amount of evil that is apparent in our world. Money is a triviality a mere measure of ability to participate in commerce. The powerful do not need it. The rich need little more of it. And aliens would probably not even want it in the first place. It may be ruled out as a goal or motivation towards evil in the general sense. However, strong its pull on all lesser forms of malice. You kind of love this guy. Powerful and controlled are insufficient also. For those who are truly in a position of power, as opposed to those who struggle for it, it is simply a part of life and one of their responsibilities. The prince of the world must pay people to do things, or they have no society. So it goes for all governments who must de delegate what gets done and where the money must go. It is not normally the intention behind such actions to gain or maintain control over the private affairs of ordinary individual people, though they may live in excess and may be thought inconsiderate. The powerful people of this world are ordinarily no more or less generous and well-mannered than their counterparts among the working class. This last fact is one that permits the final dismissal of suspects in the lineup of those responsible for the existence of evil in the world. Trouble and pain cannot be said to be a natural effect of human nature. With very few exceptions, people mean to do well for themselves and others. Desperation and lack of consideration account for nearly all lapses in civility. And those rare individuals who lend themselves intently towards spiteful aims tend to be incapacitated by their, by their frustrations. It is false to say that the wicked gain positions of power often, though it is true that money and power are often obtained without concern for the well-being of others. Lack of concern, however, is not identical with a desire to harm. And even the most heartless corporate overlords provides jobs for possibly thousands of people who put their wages to good purposes. Unfortunately, for those who wish to blame human nature, people tend to work towards what is good or towards what they all hope will be good. In order to answer the question of how evil came to be such a visible part of the world, of what inspires it, and of what that source intends, one must divide from a study of law, history, or biology and delve into the mystic past. Such a departure from standard academic philosophy is necessary here, for this is not a topic 
with which most people are comfortable or even aware. And there is no niche made for it among the standard sciences. The perspective put forth in the following paragraphs is not meant to uphold or to establish any sort of dogmatic teaching about the history of life and civilization. It should also not be misconstrued as a definitive and accurate account of what has happened in the past. This should instead be understood as a characterization of conditions which were at one time reality. Through the details of these circumstances are now lost and long forgotten. Conservative scientific estimates of the time in which modern humans have occupied this planet usually fall between 100 to 200,000 years. It should be understood that by modern humans, these scientists refer to people just like those now living in terms of physical and mental capacity. Their bodies look like the ones now seen. Their brains were the same size and ability as those now known. They were not ape-like beasts with hairy hunchbacks, brandishing bone clubs, and anything that moved and dragging women around by their hair. They were people. Given such a time span and taking for granted the equivalence of these primitive people to those who the modern times, one is left to wonder what they did with themselves for so very long to leave so little trace. The standard answer among scientists is simply that they have had few luxuries and spent their lives doing all the time-consuming chores necessary for survival. Many were apparently nomadic, and those who were not left no lasting monuments to their presumably small civilizations. The perspective unfairly judges the human character. Only a few thousand years ago, people were living by the bow and the ox-drawn plow, and their cities were built from rocks and from mud bricks. Today, though, we have not altogether abandoned these things. There have been significant improvements and innumerable additions to human technology. From Egypt to the present, the levels of material culture and society in general has been obviously and tremendously raised. Are you getting the idea that this is not what any people would think when they say the title of this series? And think about all the ignorant ones that pass it on, because they don't want to, I don't want to know any kind of this stuff. And yet, it's becoming very clear in this dynamite little book that there is something else afoot here, a true Sherlock Holmes adventure. In the light of this fact, it is nonsense to think that in a hundred thousand years or more that mankind was able to accomplish nothing beyond the production of flint arrowheads and a rare few pieces of cave graffiti. I'm not buying it either. They were not without brains nor skills nor were they without any of the same kind of devotion and drive for success and growth that are so common in the present people of the world today. Human ancestors of the distant and forgotten past, in every way similar to modern persons, would have held the same reverence and desire for sophistication in technology, language, philosophy, and organization. It is a slander to all living persons to assume that their predecessors survived and prospered to the current level of civilization only through their determination to collect nuts and throw sharp sticks at grazing animals from tens of thousands of years. It's impossible. Unfortunately, there is scarce physical evidence that such was not in fact the case if any evidence to the contrary exists at all. I was thinking while I was reading this the first time that, you know, for a percentage of my life, the idea of the 6,000-year man, you know, that's what the Abrahamic belief systems come in. And then that was bullshit. And then, you know, but when you got back past the Samarans, the Indus Valley, I mean, you get back about 12,000 years and 
there ain't anything. Very little. Unless we dig way deep. And I mean way deep. This requirement of the academic sciences is required only for academics. Those who feel it is essential to gain universal approval for an idea before giving it a second glance may as well close this book immediately, as it has already been amply stated that this is not an academic text. For the moment, though, it is enough to accept the possibility that in all these tens of thousands of years, humans were able to use their physical body and mental skills to establish a form of society that advanced significantly beyond the basket weaving and savage grunts, which so dominated the public imagination of this distant epoch. I mean, is that really what was it all about? If a civilization or given the span of time, several civilizations once existed anywhere in the world, there must have been a reason for its decline. Great things do not simply volunteer to be dismantled or put to ruin overnight. If they were overtaken by force, the conquerors revel in the glory of the thing that they so proudly and soundly put to rest. If it were simply to have dwindled apart, it would have been unlikely for the entire world to have ultimately been reduced back to a very primitive state near to the dawn of our current timeline of ancient history. From around the world, legends tell of a time before history when people were living in a much better condition than the present. The details vary widely, but the basic theme can be found in every continent. The ancient fables tell of a time when things went well and for one reason or another came to an abrupt end. Natural events like flood and volcanoes have often been pointed out as possible sources for these stories. It is not impossible for a flood to occur in areas of civilization situated in a river valley or for volcanoes to be present in the legends of people who live near them. More grandiose varieties of the same subject, like glacial melting in the Philippine supervolcano or further testament to the real presence of natural threats to large parts of human populations. From asteroids impact to terrible plagues, there are a number of obvious forces that could conceivably decimate all or almost all of human civilization in a relatively short period in time span. It is also very likely that such a thing would have occurred during the last few thousand years under the presumption that these things occur regularly, but not consistently or constantly, excuse me, a few survivors would have made some account of the disaster, or at least made some note of the fact that things went sharply downhill for humans at the same point at an indefinite pass. The widespread legends of catastrophe are precisely this sort of record. It is not necessary to pinpoint any specific event in order for the point to register and continue with the subject of demonology in its course. Whether by great flood or by Toba event or supervolcanic eruption that occurs once some every 70 million years ago or some other calamity, the human population could not have been reduced dramatically. One day there might have been a grand and effective society serving the needs of perhaps billions of people, and shortly after, they survived only a few. Whether this few were like the less than 2,000 described as having survived Toba, an isolated and ethical uh, heterogeneous family units, or whether they were like the eight people of Noah's Arks and irrelevant, the basic concept is simply that a num- large number of people living productive lives were suddenly reduced to a few bewildered survivors. For these few, the needs of staying alive would be imminent. Such a desperate condition may have prevailed for generations, but more likely of sort of miniature society would be established with relative speed. In recent similar situations, it has been shown that leaders emerge almost immediately and that progress continues as far as resources will allow. In short, order, civilizations would reemerge on a much smaller scale. Whatever level of civilization might emerge from a catastrophe, much of what once existed would have been lost. Comforts and conveniences would probably be the first things to go and the last things to reappear. 
Through the years of generations following the terrible demise of the former culture, the fledgling society would be yearning for its previous pastimes and easier modes of survival. If this were to happen today, all the nations of the world were reduced to rubble while only a random assortment of stragglers and a host of rainforest dwellers remained, the few would recall the good old days, would likely wish there were supermarkets instead of scratching up the earth for their own potatoes. They would be an endless list of lamentable losses that could apparently never be recovered without the large number of people or sophisticated technologies required to produce them. This situation or something close to it quite possibly has occurred at least once in a large span of time occupied by humans, insignificant as that span may be in terms of the greater geologic time scale. And I can't have enough time to finish this, unfortunately. So we'll just pick this up tomorrow. I love where this guy is going. Um, I want to make sure that I have it. There we go. It's a fascinating study for me. I mean, it, it, it is. And I know for many of you, I've gotten some emails on it. So what happened? I mean, there wasn't the Abrahamic religions, folks. There was no Jesus. There was no Allah. There was no Kali. I mean. They didn't exist. So what did exist? What did the civilizations of 100,000 years ago, what was their thing? Were they waiting for a savior? Or did they advance beyond that? Were the angels involved with them? Were the demons involved? Are the demons the reason for the collapses that humanity continues <clears throat> and for some reason, these angels try to come in and circumvent or intervene. I don't know. It's, it's fascinating because if you strip it all out, these beings exist. We've just renamed them. I don't know what a, a man 50,000 years ago would have called them. I often wonder. In one version of this cycle, did these angels and these demons work side by side by humans? I have read stories like that, legends. Is this where these legends came from? Is it this cycle that there has been this, like, you know, well, we're not going to get really heavily involved with the affairs, but it seems to me that they repeat the cycle. What color, <laughs> what color tie? Oh, when you have a, a shirt like this, you always want to do what I call a very nice contrasting uh, tie. So typically white works very well in this case. Um, actually, so there you go. Um, but there you go, folks. It's, it's what I ponder. I know many of you do. You have to think about these things. I mean, the results we're seeing in the prospering is remarkable. I believe we're going to see way, 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 way more, bigger. And I have a sense of us delving into at least where we're all going to have a, the same foundation of knowledge here going forward. It's going to be interesting to see what takes place. Let's see, I believe something happened to the past to cause them to decide not to be involved with us as they, Linda, that's a very interesting idea. I would probably have to agree with you on that. I think that they're, they, 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 what I'm finding out, they're there. They'll intervene in life's threatening situations, which means they've changed the timeline. Think about that. Every time they've intervened in my life, I know of at least six, maybe more. They altered my timeline, which means my timeline has been altered. So what was so if we really think about this? Holy crap, Batman. These beings have the ability to manipulate time space. And they seem to be, you have to ask them, you have to know what they do. 
I can say to Ariel, I know you bring cash, money from unexpected places. Thank you. I thank you for that. And I send you out to bring out what you do best. I mean, that's how I approach it. I read and study. Al, I know you probably are pretty well versed, but I read their attributes. It's their resume. So then I send them on their way. Just saying. See, I love the discussion. This is why we uh, get into these conversations, because I believe that within us collectively, we're going to get some answers in this. I believe that this whole group here is going to have the ability to do some changes. I, we're already doing changes. All right, I'm going to stop talking, folks. Thank you for joining. Make sure to hit the like button. You know, that helps the algorithm, right? All right, I'm just going to call on the angel Poyel and say, come on, let's uh, let's get more likes up there. All right, let's see him start coming. Come on. <laughs> All right, folks. I hope you've enjoyed it. I have. Uh, tune in tonight. Going to get another perspective. So it kind of goes in, in with this theme here. It's interesting because are we dealing with a satanic government? Is that what we're seeing taking place that the seven tenets of the satanic church with the U.S. Army is now promoting? Are we seeing a physical change that is already taking place in a spiritual hierarchy? I don't know. Tune in tonight. You'll like it. All right. Uh, much love, everyone. Uh, enjoyed it. Thank you. It's an honor to be here each day. It really is. Thank you for taking time out of your life journey to be a part of this journey. Uh, so much love to all of you. And we'll see you tonight. And then we'll see you again tomorrow. All right, folks. Big Al, much love to you. Want to use a Rolodex for cards? Alphabetic. Oh, that is a great idea. I love that. Uh, <laughs> it does, doesn't it, Doug? I got to tell you, there's some truth to this. Tune in tonight. Going to blow you away, I'll guarantee you. And it will make tomorrow's study as we get into lecture three uh, even 